Right. Good morning. Sorry for the delay this morning, uh, but I think we're set to kick off now. So um, uh, what I'll do is without further ado, I shall introduce our speaker. Uh, this morning, we're joined by Ross Teverson, who is uh, head of strategy, uh, global emerging markets at uh, Jupiter and uh, is also manager of the Jupiter Emerging and Frontier Income Trust. Uh, the trust uh, is, um, provides investors with exposure to uh, a diversified range of, of both emerging and frontier markets, whilst providing um, a very attractive dividend yield and uh, targets uh, sustained growth in dividends across the uh, for the fund. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to fade into the background and uh, pass over to Ross. Um, uh, if you have any questions at all, please go through the uh, the Q and A chat window for questions. We'll handle those at the end, uh, and um, I shall uh, control the slides for you, Ross. Just give me a, a shout when you want me to move on to the next slide, and uh, on that point, I'll um, I'll now mute myself and fade into background. Thanks very much, Dave, and thank you everyone who's who's joined this morning for this webinar. Um, I'm also joined by Matthew Piggott, a uh, colleague of mine on the Emerging Markets Desk here at Jupiter. And some of the stocks that we'll be touching on in the presentation are companies that and Matt's done a lot of work on and knows particularly well. So both of us will be speaking today. Um, but before we go in to talk about any particular stocks, I wanted to give a bit of a, a refresher or an introduction uh, for those who might be new to the trust in terms of what it is that we're looking to achieve. So Dave, if you move on to the next slide, uh, on this first slide, we have a single sentence which describes what we're looking to do. So it's investing for total return with an emphasis on income in emerging and frontier markets. Uh, that sounds like a straightforward proposition. We believe it is a simple and compelling proposition. It's also quite a unique one uh, because there aren't really any other investment trusts or funds for that matter that combine emerging and frontier exposure in the same way and have that emphasis on income uh, and the reason we launched this vehicle which we consider to be quite unique back in 2017 was that we saw what we thought was really a very compelling opportunity to offer quite a high level of income today as dave said at the start uh, this is a relatively high yielding investment trust with a trading yield of around about 4.2 percent currently uh, and a yield which if you annualize the most recent quarterly dividend is uh, closer to 4.7 or 4.8 percent um, but combining that that relatively high yield today with the potential for good long-term growth in both capital and income as well so we do believe that this is very different to a developed market vehicle yielding this kind of four percent plus level in that in, a, in developed markets you typically be you know, compromising the total return potential to get that kind of uh, income. Uh, in emerging frontier markets, it's possible to build a portfolio where you have uh, that level of income. Uh, and also, as I think you'll see in some of the stock examples, potential for very good growth in the future. So, uh, Dave, you move on to the next slide. Just uh, a few points here, giving an overview of how we manage the investment trust. So, as I've said, it's about both growth and income. Uh, we're very much bottom up stock pickers. So, what you'll see is quite a concentrated, high conviction portfolio where weightings to countries and sectors are really a function of where we're finding the best ideas rather than us taking a top-down view. As a consequence, the portfolio looks very different to the benchmark. Uh, as I'm sure people will be aware, the benchmark is quite heavily skewed towards large cap companies and also has a very high weighting in China. Uh, Jeffy, the investment trust, is very different in that it has got quite a, quite a high weighting in, in smaller companies. Uh, and also it has a lower weighting in China than the benchmark, which we think is a, a good thing um, from a long-term perspective to be more geographically diversified. We also, as the name suggests, have up to 25% exposure in frontier markets. And I'll talk a bit in a moment as to why we believe that is an attractive proposition. Uh, and I mentioned the yield at the start. So we pay quarterly dividends uh, with a trailing yield of around about 4.1%. But that trailing yield really reflects the income that the trust was generating during the COVID period, um, which we're now coming out of. As I said, the last quarterly dividend paid represents an annualized yield of about 4.7%. Uh, 
And certainly when we speak to companies, we see what is quite a promising picture in terms of continued dividend growth from this point forward. And Dave, we go on to the next slide. Just want to talk about why it is that we believe it makes a lot of sense to have frontier market exposure uh, within an emerging market fund and talk about the appeal of emerging and frontier markets in general. Well, you know, one is certainly demographics, and this won't be new to anyone that the demographic picture is very different in emerging and frontier markets. But I think it's something that's been overlooked in, in recent years. You know, there's been a preoccupation with the short term impacts of COVID. I think when we look out a number of years from here, what we should be focusing on is that you have a, a very di different demographic picture in some of these smaller emerging and frontier economies. So while we in the UK are you know, facing an aging population with a median age of 40, and that's a very similar picture in China, by the way, uh, yeah, by contrast, somewhere like Egypt's got a median age of less than 30, somewhere like Kenya, a median age of 20. So that is a, uh, a growing uh, workforce and consumer base in some of those markets, uh, which creates a tailwind for corporate earnings and economic growth. And it's a similar picture in terms of the difference in the debt profile in developed markets compared to emerging and frontier markets. So in the UK, we have very high household debt to GDP, around about 90%. If you contrast that to some somewhere like Pakistan, the other side of that chart on the right-hand side there, Pakistan has got household debt as a percentage of GDP at just 5%. So somewhere like Pakistan has got all of that growth to look forward to that we've enjoyed over you know, the last three or four decades in the UK that comes from uh, a gradual rise in the availability and use of debt by households. Um, and just the last point to make on governance, because you know, Matt and I do get a lot, a lot of questions as to whether or not governance is something that's challenging in emerging and frontier markets. And I think those questions suggest that you know, perceptions are perhaps a little bit outdated compared to the reality. And the reality is that governance has improved massively across many emerging and frontier market companies. And one of the best ways of evidencing that is simply the fact that uh, a higher proportion of emerging market companies now pay a dividend than is the case in developed markets. And of course, dividends are you know, this, this single best indication that management are aligned with us as minority shareholders and willing to return cash to us as shareholders. So if we go on to the next slide, we just want to illustrate uh, just how important income has been as a driver of returns for emerging market investors since 2000. If you look at this chart with emerging markets on the left, the total return of emerging markets has clearly been pretty impressive compared to a lot of other asset classes. Um, what is perhaps surprising is that over half of the total return that investors have uh, received from emerging market equities has actually been as a function of the dividends that are being paid. So dividends have been and we believe will be an important part of the total return picture in emerging markets. Uh, now, if we move on to the next slide, um, this is how we think about dividends and dividend buckets within the Jeffy uh, Investment Trust portfolio. The, the first bucket I'll highlight is the, the top middle bucket, future income potential. So this is the smallest bucket, around about 10% of the portfolio at any given point in time. But I think it's really important that we give ourselves the flexibility to own companies that are relatively low yielders today, but which have got the potential for high growth high cash generation and a future potential to pay significant dividends. Um, even if the other two buckets, high income visibility and income growth, uh, together these make up about 90% of the portfolio. High income visibility, as the name suggests, are ones where there's a very predictable dividend stream, typically quite a high level of dividend, more than 5% yield. Income growth, by contrast, I'd say um, you know, while these are companies where there's also quite a lot of visibility on dividends, there's a, an even stronger growth picture. And a lot of our Taiwanese exposure would fit into this. So you know, multinational uh, tech companies based in Taiwan that uh, sit on significant cash, pay quite a lot of cash out to shareholders, but also have got potential to, to grow quite strongly from here as well. If we move on to the, the next slide, please, Dave. Um, just want to say a bit about the stewardship. Obviously, there's a huge amount of talk about ESG today. Um, we are not changing what we do. So stewardship has always been at the heart of our investment process and approach. There are three things that matter in particular to us, and that is alignment of management. I touched on that earlier when talking about dividends. Uh, 
capital management, and obviously capital management relates to dividends to some extent as well, and also environmental and social risk mitigation. So we are typically excluding companies because of the sector they operate in or the geography they operate in. You know, we're quite happy to invest in a, a mining company. After all, mining is an essential part of the economy. Um, and actually, a lot of mined commodities are central to the, the energy transition that's taking place as well. But what we do want to see is we want to see companies um, taking the right steps to mitigate the environmental and social risks associated with that type of business. So we'll have uh, regular engagements with companies and encourage companies to improve practices. And I think we've seen a big improvement actually uh, across emerging markets in terms of not only what companies are doing, but what companies are reporting and explaining to investors as well. Um, Dave, if you move on to the following slide, we just want to touch on performance briefly. Um, so I should say straight away that 2020 was a tough year for a lot of smaller emerging markets and frontier markets. It was uh, a tough year for us in terms of the um, relative performance of the trust NAV return. What we've seen since 2020, though, um, and back to what we've seen since November of 2020, is quite a strong pickup in the absolute and relative performance of a lot of emerging and frontier market companies. It's been good for the trust NAV return um, year to date and over the last 12 months. And it, the frontier exposure that we have, which had been a, a headwind in 2020, that's become a tailwind as people have moved on from the immediate impact of COVID and people are starting to look through to the longer term growth opportunity that exists in a lot of those markets. Um, we move on to the following slide. Sorry, Dave, we could just move on to the next slide, please. Um, so I said at the start, we'll talk about some stocks because I think the, talking about the stocks that we have really brings to life uh, both the valuation opportunity in the asset class, because certainly we see a lot of attractively valued companies uh, and also the growth opportunity as well. Now, we're completely bottom up, as I said earlier. Um, we, we're not thematic investors, but what we find is that there are a number of clear structural changes or themes that uh, our companies are exposed to. One of these is rising financial inclusion. Uh, another is technology enablers. And another is rising discretionary spending. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we'll say a little bit first of all about financial inclusion. And you know, financial inclusion is commonly thought of as being about bringing the previously unbanked into the financial system. And that is, of course, quite a big part of financial inclusion. But it's about a lot more than that as well. It's about offering products and services through new channels to individuals who would never have previously had those products and services. And you know, those go way beyond bank accounts. Those are uh, lending products, those are insurance products, asset management products, those types of things as well. And you know, clearly in developed markets, there's a lot of excitement around pure fintech businesses. Um, what we think is, is much more exciting in emerging frontier markets is where you've got strong to traditional banking franchises, banks like Kenya Commercial Bank or Bank of Georgia, and where the management teams of those companies are are really willing to embrace technology to grow the business and take the business forward. So Kenya Commercial Bank, for example, they were the original banking partner for M-Pesa, which is a mobile money platform in Kenya that's often held up as a great example of how uh, technology can be used to bring people into the financial system. Uh, bank of Georgia, they're, they're the leading payments business as well as the leading bank uh, in Georgia. And they're, they're using that or leveraging that position to offer all sorts of new services to both consumers and businesses. Uh, I just um, asked Matt to come in at this point and say a little bit about Bolsa Mexicana, quite different to those banks I talked about, but I think also one that's got a lot of long-term growth potential. Sure, thanks, Ross. Um, so, so Bolsa is the, um, is the dominant stock exchange in Mexico. The company is formerly, formerly the monopoly um, stock exchange, and even though the, the market is now competitive, the sort of the entrenched advantages that also have, I mean, that they still have an over 90% market share across all the sort of major business lines of a, of a stock exchange. Um, it, you know, even, by, even by Latin American standards, Mexico has a very underpenetrated um, capital market framework. Um, so, you know, the company fits well into our sort of broader definition of um, financial inclusion. Um, 
a good way to illustrate that is sort of something that we um, often look at is you know, Mexico and Spain are, are similar sized economies. Um, yet Spain has over 3,000 listed companies um, and Mexico has just under 300. Um, so you can see the very kind of um, that sort of very long runway for growth that um, Mexico and, and Bolsa have. Just on just and just say brief word on the valuation. I mean, Bolsa currently trades at around a mid-teens price to earnings multiple, which you know, if, if you're familiar with stock exchanges globally, um, you know, that's a very attractive level. And you know, that enables about a you know just over four percent dividend yield, um, you know, which we certainly expect to grow um, over time. Thanks, Matt. And can we Dave, can we move on to the next slide? We'll just talk a little bit about technology enablers as well. Um, and before I talk about these, I'll, I'll just say as you said at the start, we'll try and uh, make sure we get finished in plenty of time to address questions. I can see there's some good questions coming through already. So um, we'll just spend another five minutes or so just talking about some of the, the stocks and then um, leave plenty of time for Q&A. So on technology enablers, uh, these are companies that, as the name suggests, are really critical to enabling some of the big technological changes taking place in the world today. These are not household names, but their products are basically in every household. And just to illustrate what I mean, uh, MediaTek, which is one of our top five holdings, that is the world's largest uh, designer and uh, producer of chips that power Android handsets. They also custom design chips for things like the Amazon Echo. So if you have an Echo smart speaker in your house, you're using uh, a MediaTek powered product, even if it's not immediately obvious. Uh, MediaTek is really expanding the addressable market and entering into to new segments. The valuation of something like MediaTek is, is much more attractive than the valuation of many of its customers. So uh, MediaTek trades about 13 and a half times this year's earnings uh, and also generates uh, around about 5% dividend yield as well. Uh, Chroma ATE, a Taiwanese small cap. Uh, this is a holding that we've had in the trust since launch. Um, and it's a really interesting small business in that it is providing testing equipment for a whole range of clean tech applications. Uh, it's, for example, servicing solar cell manufacturers, LED manufacturers. And in recent years, it's seen a growing contribution from electric vehicle related testing as well. So about 30% of their revenue today comes in one way or another from electric vehicle related uh, batteries and component testing. Uh, in the interest of time, just move on to the next slide, which is on rising discretionary spending. And the idea that there is growing disposable income in emerging and frontier markets and you know, companies will benefit from that. I think there's nothing new in that idea. Uh, it is a powerful long-term trend and companies like Emar Malls, which basically is the, the, bull, the, the, the mall at the base of the Burj Khalifa, one of the top shopping destinations globally for emerging market consumers. A company like that is going to be a clear beneficiary. A company like Indus Motors in Pakistan as well, which is the Toyota Motor joint venture, selling a Toyota branded vehicles into an underpenetrated market that's growing quite rapidly. Um, you know, I think that's an obvious beneficiary of consumer spending. What may be a bit less obvious is IDH. That's a medical diagnostics company in Egypt. But I'll let Matt say a bit about IDH. It's a stock that he's uh, done a lot of work on. Sure. So, um, so healthcare is you know, a form of discretionary spending, and you know, in in Egypt there is you know, no GP network equivalent. So, um, IDH run the country's biggest uh, diagnostic diagnostic testing business. They have about a sixty percent market share of the private market, um, and they actually have nascent and expanding businesses. Um, in other parts of Africa, most notably uh, Nigeria. So um, IDH is, is, is listed in London, um, trades at about a 4% dividend yield right now, a very cash generative um, business, uh, a very good management team. Um, and you know, again, one that we see very good long-term growth prospects for. Okay, thanks Matt. And Dave, could we just move on to the next slide, please? Um, in this slide, this world map, we've talked about quite a few of these holdings already. Companies like Bolsa, Mexicana, the Mexican Stock Exchange, IDH in Egypt, which Matt just touched on. But really what we want to illustrate with this is that uh, it is a diverse portfolio in terms of sector and geographical exposure. Some of the other businesses on here are, for example, salmon farming in Chile, port operations in Brazil, 
Um, or NetEase, you see there in China, is uh, one of the leading mobile games publishers in China, publishing things like the Harry Potter game franchise uh, and Minecraft as well. So yeah, we're generating uh, quite a decent level of income today, as we said, uh, from businesses that we believe have got good long-term growth prospects, and they're really quite a diversified collection of, of businesses that we're invested in. And Dave, if you move on to the next slide, uh, we just want to give you a few statistics in terms of how the portfolio, how the Jeffy portfolio differs to the, the index. Um, obviously, that frontier exposure is a differentiator. Also, the small cap exposure, which I mentioned at the start, at 56% versus less than 1% for the index. I mean, that is obviously a big difference. Uh, and we think from a long-term perspective, it makes a lot of sense for investors to be accessing some of these smaller companies like Chroma, which I mentioned earlier, which are very well-run businesses with, with good long-term growth prospects. And if we move on to the next slide, uh, just to sum up before we go to some of the questions, um, yeah, I hope it's come through in what we've uh, talked about in terms of individual stocks that we believe the portfolio is very well positioned to benefit from structural change in emerging and fronting markets, whether that be in the form of financial inclusion or technology enablers or rising discretionary spending. We do believe that there's potential for significant long-term dividend growth from what is quite a respectable level of yield today, so 4.1% on a 12-month trading basis. Um, but 4.7% if you annualise that most recent quarterly dividend we paid. Uh, valuations, I've uh, talked about valuations for some individual stocks, but valuations really are um, yeah, attractive in our view when you compare emerging markets versus developed markets. And then if you compare the Jeffy portfolio to the emerging markets index, it's even more attractive again in our view. So about nine times price to earnings for the average portfolio uh, valuation versus about 14 times earnings for MSCI emerging markets. And just the last point, um, if fundamentals for underlying companies uh, should be supportive of earnings growth, not just because these are businesses that uh, have uh, long-term growth potential and, you know, and, and strong financial positions, but also because as we come out of the period when COVID has had an impact on economic activity, uh, as we see uh, a strong recovery continue from 2021 through to 2022. Um, that bodes well for both earnings and dividend growth. And I'll, I'll stop there as I can see the questions are coming in. So I'll hand back to Dave. Um, I don't know, Dave, if you want to uh, search a few questions to, to go through. Hi, uh, hi again. Yes, thanks very much for that. And uh, yes, we'll uh, we'll go through some questions. Uh, but before we before we do, just I just wanted to pop back to one of the slides, if I may. This question I could have been might well be of interest to others. Let's go um, take you back one. Um, on on this slide, it flags a uh, number of countries you're exposed to twenty one relative to the index at twenty seven. So where are the, the the markets that you're not exposed to? The countries you're not exposed to relative to the index. Um, so a, a number of the smaller Latin American countries are in MSCI Emerging Markets Index, um, but they're not in the portfolio. So you know, a good example of that would be somewhere like Peru. Um, yeah, 21 markets in our view, that's, that's a pretty high level of geographical diversification for yeah. a portfolio that has 40, 46 holdings. Um, you know, when I say we're not invested in a market like Peru, um, it's not because we you know, have any objection or a particularly negative view on the market. It's simply that we're finding our highest conviction ideas across those other 21 markets where we are invested. Absolutely. Right. And uh, on some of the questions we've received. Um, so let's start with straightforward ones on the portfolio. So what's your average holding period for uh, investments within the portfolio? So if you look at our level of turnover, uh, it's typically it, a little bit below 30%. So that's sort of reflective of an average holding period of around about three years. Um, but there are certainly plenty of companies that we would own for more than three years. So I mentioned Chroma ATE, the Taiwanese testing company. That's a company that's been in there since we launched um, in uh, May 2017. Yeah, there are quite a few examples of companies that have been in there for the life of the trust so far. Yeah, thank you. And um, how were dividends impacted by the pandemic? So actually, for, for a lot of our companies, there was no impact, um, particularly for 
companies in the in the technology space they actually continued to grow earnings and they continued to pay dividends where we did see an impact uh, was across our emerging and frontier market bank holdings uh, all of them uh, either you know, temporarily emitted dividends or were asked by their regulators to be conservative and not pay dividends for a certain period and then what we saw is starting in September of 2020 those all started coming back so it, it started with banks like Spurbank in Russia which you know was a very strong capital position continued to be profitable it was easy for them to pay a dividend so as soon as they were allowed to they did um, and then the most recent company and the last of our bank holdings to return to paying normal dividends was Bank of Georgia uh, that was announced around the middle of this year and of course Georgia was as an economy Georgia was impacted more than some others because it's got a very high reliance on tourism but even in Georgia things are bouncing back quite strongly and uh, you know the bank and the regulator took the view that they were fine to start paying dividends again so it's been I think a much faster recovery in dividends than a lot of people would have expected uh, you know if you go back to um, April or May of last year Okay, and uh, uh, how might uh, emerging markets countries be impacted by rising interest rates going forward? Yeah, very topical question. And I think the short answer is that as long as interest rates aren't overly steep, or sorry, interest rate hikes aren't overly steep or aggressive, uh, I think that is absolutely fine for emerging markets. So you, we, we speak to companies a lot and we do see some signs of persistent inflationary pressures. So everything from Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturers to Indian IT services companies, they're seeing their costs rise and they're passing that on to their customers. The important word there is passing, or words are passing on, um, because I think where companies have pricing power and they can pass on cost increases, a little bit of inflation uh, does not matter at all. There's also, of course, the question of, you know, if US rates go up, is that is that bad because it causes capital to be pulled back from emerging markets? You know, that has happened at some points in the past, but I think what's very different today is the valuation um, disconnect between some US stocks and a lot of emerging market stocks. So you may well see that very highly rated stocks in developed markets are actually much more vulnerable to higher interest rates than some of these very lowly valued businesses in emerging and frontier markets that, uh, you know, that, that, that are attractively valued with good growth prospects. So I think a little bit of inflation and, and some rate hikes are perfectly digestible. Yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, I, I think a question that's often asked, uh, how do you implement due diligence in countries where corruption or a lack of transparency might present an issue? That's a good question. and. Um, I think the fact that we're income focused, that makes it a little bit easier for us, because as I said, as I said earlier on in the presentation, where companies have got a history of paying meaningful dividend payments and they have a dividend policy in place, yeah, that is very tangible evidence that yeah, there is a willingness to you know, keep returning cash to shareholders. Um, you know, companies that are poorly governed may have a tendency to you know, divert cash for other purposes, but the dividends give us a real uh, assurance that that is not the case. Yeah, another thing as well, when I talk about alignment, what we, alignment of management and minority shareholders, what's really helpful is when companies have got long-term equity-based compensation plans in place. Uh, and that's helpful on a number of fronts. So if management have got long-term equity, then you know, they want to see the share price go up. They want to see dividends. And, and perhaps more importantly, they want to protect the business from any kind of um, you know, any any wrongdoing that might undermine it. So it's uh, it's it's very helpful. And most of our holdings have exactly that that long term equity based compensation in place for management. So Matt, there's anything you'd want to add there? No, I think that I mean we have a um, we have a framework um, in which we look at um, exactly these sorts of issues. Um, you know, we look at alignment we have a you know five point check plan for you know what we're looking for between uh, management and minority shareholders what the role of the any majority shareholder is what the track record is um and you know that's that's a um that's a template we've had you know looking at our companies for you know at least last four or five years um uh so it's 
that's something that we're very familiar with and we try to have um you know consistency throughout the fund uh you know for the sorts of management teams and, and practices we're looking for yeah that's a, I, mean, I think that makes an important point so we, we have that as part of our process and we also have at our disposal uh jupiter's governance and sustainability resources so actually very recently just two weeks ago we spoke to a, a pakistani bank because one of the third party data providers was scoring it as high risk from a, a you know, governance point of view. And I think that's getting to exactly the point that this question is, you know, somewhere like Pakistan, obviously there are, there are risks around governance and corruption. Um, we then engaged with the company. Um, as it turns out, the company has actually had EY, so a global auditing firm, working with them for two years to improve all of their procedures and processes to minimize the risk posed by things like anti-money laundering legislation. Um, and you know, the reality of that company is that they're, they're doing a lot. But the good thing is that we are engaging with them, making sure that's the case, and also encouraging a company in that instance to go to the third party data provider and say, look, actually, what we're doing is much better than what's reflected in your scoring system. And I think that's quite an important part of the process for uh, you know, improving the perception of emerging and frontier market companies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and here's an interesting question. Uh, when analysing a company, do you take into account structural differences um, and flags macro government liquidity between emerging companies, uh, smaller emerging market companies and frontier market companies? So it's really looking at the different aspects of of, um, of how the company um, accounting and structure between regions is set up, I guess. Um, I guess that's quite a few different considerations there. Um, yeah, maybe maybe not ex getting straight to the point of the question, but one related point is liquidity of individual stocks. And I think that you know, frontier markets do perhaps get a bit overlooked because liquidity for some of the names is, is, is lower. So some large emerging market funds might not consider some smaller frontier market names. But I think that, well, that also really creates an a great long-term opportunity and a trust is a great structure for accessing for example a, you know, a name like Indus Motors that uh, Pakistani Toyota Motor Joint Venture which I mentioned it trades at less than $500,000 a day so respectable liquidity but not high enough to attract some big international investors in in the meantime we're getting paid a high single digit dividend yield to wait and I'm sure in time that will be a bigger more liquid business so um you know, the, the structure is different for some of these markets, um, but that creates opportunities. I think in, it, in terms of you know, the other considerations there, um, you know, from accounting, an accounting standards point of view, that is increasingly becoming standardized uh, you know, and, and more international. So I think that's getting easier and easier over time. Um, and you know, in terms of stock market access, uh, and it's really actually, you know, very straightforward accessing most of these markets. There's a question on, uh, asked earlier, um, I think something on, on discussing engagement. Um, can you provide an, an example of engagement? What was the objective and was it achieved? Yes, so, um, well, actually, I, I kind of answered this when I was talking about uh, that, that bank that scored quite poorly on the um, third party data. Uh, providers, yeah. but where you know they've actually got EY consulting for them, you know, putting in place international uh, an international standard of um, processes and uh, controls around anti anti money laundering. So I, I think the you know, the objective there was to understand what the company is doing and if it's doing the right things, which it is, get the score improved. And you know we have put them in touch with that third party data provider and. You know, we anticipate that it will improve. Um, it, I guess other examples on the environmental side, uh, we you know, are looking for best possible disclosure from companies. And I think that you know, a company like Norilsk Nickel, the Russian miner we, we've been engaging with for some time, there's been a big improvement there in terms of their disclosure and plans for carbon emissions. Uh, and also for minimising the risk of any future environmental accidents as well from what is a, you know, an inherently high risk business. Um, so uh, whether it's just down to us or whether it's down to foreign investors in general, um, engaging with them on that is hard to say, but there's definitely been an improvement. 
And you know, I'd say with a business like Norris Nickel, it may be you know, a, you know, an inherently risky mining business, but actually what they're producing, nickel for electric vehicle batteries, copper for you know, clean tech infrastructure and palladium and platinum for auto catalysts, those are commodities that are absolutely essential to the, uh, the, uh, the energy transition. So I think it's important that people are investing in and engaged with those sorts of businesses. Thanks. Uh, and how important is domestic investment? Uh, so I've understood the question properly. So in terms of uh, domestic retail and institutional investors in some of these smaller markets? I believe so, yes. Yeah, now that's a, that's a, that, that is a really interesting question. It's, it's not one that we've had very often, um, but actually it gets to an important point, which is you know, what's going to drive up valuations in some of these markets that are quite overlooked by international investors. And I think, you know, it could be exactly that. Um, you know, retail investors looking for yield from local equities. We've seen this in Russia already, where there was a big um, uptick in retail investor activity, and that really helped to re-rate some Russian companies. And that could become a broader phenomenon across um, emerging markets. And if that happens in Mexico, a stock like Bolsa Mexicana, which Matt talked about earlier, that would be a major beneficiary of it. So not talked about very much, but an important question. And um, you know, we anticipate we'll see more domestic investor participation in some of these markets. Yeah, I think that just, just, just on Mexico, I think Mexico is a very good example um, of a country with a, um, with a retail investor base uh, at a very immature um, phase. So um, we, we actually spoke to the, the management team of, of Bolsa about this recently. It's clearly um, you know, a very important long-term driver for them to have um, you know, the adult population engaged in, um, you know, n n not just share trading, but, you know, it's also managing, you know, managing your own pensions, um, you know, managing on the fixed income side. Um, and, you know, they compare it to the US where 60% of adults, um, you know, regularly trade shares. Um, in Mexico, that figure, uh, that figure is low single digit. Um, and we've seen some big investments in, uh, Mexican platform companies, so similar to sort of HL type um, model. There's been two of those in the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, we think that's going to be a, you know, a very uh, underappreciated, but very powerful 10-year uh, driver for you know, Mexican equities. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions uh, on uh, impacts, uh, I guess, impacts specifically on economies here uh, and then and the com underlying companies. Um, are rising inflation and are rising energy prices a concern? Uh, yes, we, we were talking about this on the desk just the other day, actually. And what we were specifically focusing on is the fact that historically, if energy prices had ridden, had risen this much, um, you, know, you would expect Russia to be a big beneficiary, as we've seen. You'd also expect India to be quite negatively impacted by that as a, as a significant net importer of, of oil. So far, that hasn't been the case. So you know, India has performed pretty well as an equity market, uh, despite rising oil prices. And I think that's because in, in a number of these markets that are net importers, there are some other dynamics that are proving to be more important than higher energy costs. So, you know, a reform agenda, um, a pickup in corporate capex from low levels, uh, and you know, quite a strong post-COVID recovery as well. So I don't think we would want to see oil prices much higher than this from the perspective of some of these net importing economies like India or you know, Turkey or Kenya for that matter. Um, but certainly, so far, they seem to be weathering that pressure quite well. Matt, does any add to that? No, I mean, I think, it, you know, it's, the picture is different for, you know, across emerging markets. So, you know, obviously, the, you know, the likes of Russia benefiting at the moment, um, but the likes of, you know, Turkey and, and, and India less so. Um, but, you know, overall, I don't think we've seen a major impact across any of our holdings. Right. And um, I, th I think uh, the, 
but given the uh, the diversification or the, the diversified ability to invest across a range of markets, I think I don't the answer to this, but um, the question is asked is whether or not you have the well have the ability to invest in unquoted at all. Um, yeah, that, that that is a question actually that it never used to come up, and I think it's, it's come up uh, a few times in recent history. Uh, the short answer is we can, uh, but we don't. And the reason we don't currently have any unquoted investments is because when I look at, or when we look at some of the opportunities in listed small caps, I met, gave the example earlier of Indus Motors, uh, that is you know, so compelling in our view that we don't really feel the need to go into the unquoted space. There are some really interesting opportunities in the listed space. Um, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll maintain that, that scope and that ability to go unlisted, but uh, I don't anticipate doing so in the, you know, in the medium term. Yeah, thanks. Uh, with uh, the recent volatility in China, have you uh, looked at uh, any potential new investments uh, to add to the portfolio in that market? Yes, we have. So you know, we, we've consistently had a much lower weighting in China than the benchmark. That, that hurt us last year. That's been good for us over the last year or so as Chinese equities have, have come off. Uh, but that weakness we've seen in the Chinese equity market, that's that's created some opportunities at the margin to either add to existing holdings we had that we felt became you know, oversold, dragged down in the general China sell-off, uh, and also to, to add um, one or two new names as well, where we felt the valuation opportunity was had become quite compelling. Uh, we continue to have minimal exposure to Chinese internet in the trust. We have one name, which is NetEase, the mobile games publisher that I talked about earlier, which is a consistent dividend payer. Uh, and we don't have any exposure to Chinese banks um, or property. So we've consistently been of the view that while well, Chinese banks and property companies are cheap, uh, they are they're fairly opaque and, in the case of property companies, quite vulnerable to the very high levels of aggregate debt in China, you know, over 300% debt to GDP. So not dramatically changing anything with respect to our thinking around China, but we are opportunistically you know, adding to some names that have become more attractively valued. Right. And then I suspect you've kind of, to some extent, answered this next question, which um, follows on and says, are you worried about the changing in regulatory environment in China? Um, I'm sure Matt will almost certainly have more to say on this, um, but I would say the short answer is not overly concerned. It, 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 there's a, this policy of common prosperity, and I think it is exactly that which Xi Jinping is trying to achieve. Um, it, private companies probably had uh, too much freedom uh, in some instances to you know, charge consumers what they wanted and to behave however they wanted from a competitive point of view. Uh, and it's you know, appropriate to have some regulation. I don't think that uh, China is going to clamp down so hard on the private sector that it will uh, reduce the incentive for private companies to invest because Xi Jinping is very aware that if common prosperity is going to be achieved and the private sector is going to be a key enabler of that. But, Massively yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, essentially not, we're not, we're not overly concerned. I mean, you know, China has a policy to double GDP by 2035. Um, and, you know, that is simply not possible if it is led by, you know, what are effectively the old economy state um, owned um, enterprises. So, um, you know, the private sector is, is hugely valuable to China. It's, it's, it's you know, really transformed the economy um, you know, sort of beyond recognition from you know 2000, um, and you know that's very valuable to the um, you know to the Chinese Communist Party, to the whole Chinese um, you know, the whole Chinese society. So um, when we get these these waves of regulation, you know, they must be seen in, in the context of you know previous waves of, of regulation, um, and you know the Chinese style is to not to do much regulation for you know, reasonable periods of time, sometimes a number of years, and then do quite a lot quite quickly. Um, and you know, because there is no, you know, lobbying, there are no, you know, there's no great judicial process. When these regulations come in, they come in pretty quickly, and you know, they can cause a bit of um, upset in equity markets, particularly amongst you know, foreign investors.
Um, so, I mean, that's why sort of it's sort of mid to long term. It's it's not a great concern, and you know, and a, a lot of the things that the Chinese are doing are not dissimilar to, you know, what's going on in the US and in Europe to, um, you know, to address some of the the issues that the kind of new economy companies are presenting. So, you know, for example, uh, banning video games or limiting the time on video games, you know, for children under twelve. Um, you know, providing more social security for you know, gig economy employees. You know, these are all things that you know, if they happened in the West, they you, you know, there wouldn't be great surprise. So overall, it's been you know, it's clearly been a it's it's been a very you know volatile period, and you know, it is unnerving and is obviously um, damaging to um, you know to emerging market equity holders and to Chinese equity holders. Um, but you know, we think the mid to long term picture is, is broadly unchanged and uh this was uh picking up on something that came out of cop 26 uh what are your thoughts on india targeting net zero carbon two decades later than other countries yeah i mean it, does, it feels like a long way away um you know, i actually thought when that headline when that headline came out um i'm going to be 93 by the time uh india reaches net zero but then, you know, India is at a very different stage, obviously. And I think you know, it's progress that there has at least been a target now set. Um, and ideally, you know, that would be something sooner than 2070. But you know, we are seeing progress in India on renewables investment. We are seeing progress on uh, move to you know, gas um, as an energy source in in urban areas and of course gas is still carbon intensive but it is much less carbon intensive than other fossil fuels so i think that there are signs that india has successfully begun the energy transition um, and it may well accelerate and, and happen faster than those recent headlines suggest uh, and uh, which other funds do you consider your main competitors um I prefer not to talk about other uh, funds to actually name other funds, but I think you know, there, are, there are obviously, um, you know, I'm sure everyone will be aware of dedicated frontier funds um, and emerging market income funds. You know, they are obviously you know, operating in a similar kind of universe to us, but they are nonetheless different. Um, let's put it another way what we what we're doing is quite unique in the way in which it combines emerging and frontier exposure um and you know in in our view the, the the nature of the income and the income growth potential as well and uh, are there any are there any other uh, vehicles um that uh, across both open and closed ended that that have a similar remits uh, or is it a very unique one do you think um it is quite unique. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I, I would. Um, I, I, I couldn't name another investment vehicle which you know match, which is the same in terms of the the, the composition of the, the 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 sort of geographical and sector composition of the portfolio and the and, and the income objective. Income objective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, well, there's one more question here, and it's uh, finally on um, uh, whether or not managers are invested in the company themselves. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so um, you know, I have been since launch and over that period have added to that holding. So um, very much a, you know, a believer in the long term potential of this. And I think it's important to be aligned. <laughs> Going back to what I was saying about you know, company management teams having long term equity ownership in businesses. I think the same should apply to, uh, to us as managers. So, yes. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, uh, that's us done with the questions and I'd uh, like to thank you both for your time this morning and our audience today for joining us. If there are any other questions, uh, please send them through to uh, myself. Uh, my email is dm at martinandco.com and I'll ensure they're forwarded on to the managers. Uh, and uh, here's the team up here now, as you can see, a, 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 a nice, a very uh, wide, wide team covering the fund. And just making sure that 
we get to the disclosure at the end to ensure that's there as well. And uh, thank you very much for everybody today. And um, this recording will be uh, will be made available on the Quoted Data website after the event if anybody wants to, to go into the detail again. Um, and uh, thank you all for today and um, I hope you have a good day. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Dave. Cheers.